Hey now, welcome to another edition of the Inside BS Show. Today we're talking about one of my favorite subjects. Those of you who are viewers or listeners of the show know I love intellectual property. I love the value it adds to your business. I love that you have the ability to create something that can make the world a better place, but you can also make it your own. And today we have an expert who's going to share with us how to protect that intellectual property, share with us some potential ways to monitor that intellectual property. My guest is Edward Weiss. He's a, a, an intellectual property attorney based in New York. I am super excited to have him. So please join me in welcoming Edward to the Inside BS Show. Edward, thanks for being here. Thanks, Dave. Thanks for having me. All right. So I got to ask you this question because I heard a rumor that your law school graduation was memorable in some way. Tell me, what is the story with your law school graduation? Uh, OK, so um, I am a musician at heart and I've always been playing um, music, you know, mostly in rock bands and so on. And uh, I was I was in a band at the time of law school, um, where we started recording and we were signed to a a, a deal. And I took a leave of uh, one year from law school in order to perform more and record and so on, and then went back to law school to finish. And this was in '91, and if people remember their U.S. history, Desert Storm hit at that time. And it ended fairly quickly. And by about May of that year, um, there were a lot of troops over there with basically nothing to do and bored and so on. And one of the my bandmates nephews was a Marine and he was complaining about it. And we signed up to do a Department of Defense tour um, to entertain the troops. And I was, of course, reluctant because I had a job offer and I have to explain to my future employer, hey, I know I'm graduating this summer, but I got to go over there for a month and, and do this. Um, and, you know, so it was, it was um, a bit, I was a bit nervous about that. Um, but everything lined up. Um, Barbary was great, not to plug them necessarily, but this is amazing. You're going, take all of these cassette tapes, if people remember what those are, take all of these lectures on cassette tapes. You can keep up with the course there and study for the bar there in you know the library tent on the Cobar base. And um, my employer was also great about it. My law school did a little write up about it. And on the day of my and my mom was of course not you know a little upset that I wouldn't be there for commencement, but okay. And on the day of the graduation, you know word got out and we're playing at this UN camp in Kuwait with the oil fires going on behind us. And the, uh, my lead singer stops and the, the head of the UN camp comes up and he makes some announcement. I'm like, what is going on here? And then they, you know, like presented me with this printed out diploma from the whatever and everyone's it was it was it was quite memorable it was amazing oh that's a fantastic story wow well thank you for doing that i'm sure the troops really appreciated it it was it was really great of you to do that and now it's a fantastic story that you can uh that you can tell to people it really you know it really says a lot about you so um that, that's a great great story Edward, talk about uh, talk about intellectual property law. So you graduate from law school. Do you, did you go into intellectual property right away? And was your your background as a musician did that inform that decision, or was it just something that you chose on your own? So I'm I am an intellectual property attorney who also handles patents. And in the patent world, you there's a separate bar exam that you need to take to practice patents in front of the U.S. Patent Trademark Office. And in order to sit for that bar exam, you need um, a technical degree in something. Usually it's engineering, but it could be chemistry and some other science disciplines too. So I was very much a scientist, kind of uh, geeky engineer, musician who would you know, mess with his own you know, guitar effects and bass effects and bass player. So, right? so I would do that stuff. So I had an interest in engineering. And I really enjoyed the engineering um, program at, I went to Rutgers, um, but 
graduating and then working as an engineer for a short time, I realized that the career path wasn't for me. Um, because, you know, you, you come out of school where you're learning something new every semester, basically. Yes, it's all within the engineering world of geekiness, I'm sorry, but still pretty cool, you know. Um, but when you're working for a company, um, and I was working at a company in Princeton, um, you know, now as an engineer, you're focusing on that one particular thing for however long that project goes. So that's when I realized it wasn't for me. Um, and I'm looking at alternatives and the supervisor at the time suggested patent law. And really at that time, you know, I knew what patents were, but I never really gave it much thought. Um, so, you know, fast forward, I went to law school and that was now my focus is to get into patent law primarily because I used my technical degree as a stepping stone for that career path. Um, but, you know, as you know, IP really covers copyrights and trademarks as well as patents. And, you know, my particular career path was that I took a, uh, a job at a boutique intellectual property firm out of school. And, you know, as people, you know, would probably expect if you were working in a smaller firm, a boutique firm, you, you need to wear multiple hats. Um, you know, they, they don't have like the, the silos for everybody as defined as maybe in a big firm. So you will get up to speed typically on, you know, this is a trademark matter, figure out how to handle this opposition proceeding. This is a copyright matter, um, some litigation, patent prosecution, all of those things. And that, uh, that experience made me, you know, well-versed in the intellectual property realm, not just in patents and not just specifically in electrical engineering based types of patents. Okay. So let's talk about the different types of patents because I'm, I'm a little familiar with them, but some of our, some of our viewers, some of our listeners may not be familiar with them. What are the different types of patents? And by that, I mean, a lot of patent attorneys, like you said, some people have engineering backgrounds. So there are mechanical and, you know, patents, and then there are chemical patents. Explain to people what some of the different types of patents are. So, so from, from categories, just, just basic statutory categories, there are design patents, there are utility patents, and believe it or not, there are also plant patents that cover what it says what it is. Um, so a design patent protects the aesthetic appearance of a useful utilitarian article. Okay, that's a design patent. So there were cases a few years back with, with um, Apple and Motorola, and Apple was asserting various design patents on the iPhone, um, right? So it had nothing to do with the function of the iPhone and what the on-off button did and what the dimmer switch did and all of those other types of things, or some syncing controls where you could sync contacts from one Apple device to another had nothing to do with that. It had to do with this is what it looks like. You're selling something that looks like what the design patent covers without getting into the real science stuff. Okay. Um, a utility patent um, would cover the many categories that you mentioned. It could be chemical, all right, a pharmaceutical composition. It could be an electrical device, a video streaming method, a, uh, an actual, you know, widget, a garden hose attachment, you know, nozzle, uh, a new type of tire. It could be any of those things. And it could, it could also cover um, methods of, uh, of, um, you know, or pro process patents, let's say process patents, a process for making a tire, a process for streaming video, um, you know, uh, data, um, uh, d data transmission, you know, any of those things, right? The process is sort of a recipe of steps. You do this, then you do this, then you, you create this and you use that new thing to do your next step and so on. So those are the, those are the different, the, the different categories of patents. 
Okay, now how do I decide whether I should patent something or just keep it as a trade secret? So for example, the Coca-Cola recipe, right? They that's a trade secret. They never they never protected that by going for a patent. What goes into making that decision? Well, not every trade secret is patentable. Um, maybe we should talk about what the um, patent law is for. And, um, you know, just give maybe your, your listeners an understanding of how it works, right? So, so on the one hand, you have inventors who are reluctant to disclose their creations to the public because they're concerned that once they disclose them, they'll be, you know, copied. They'll be ripped off, however you want to, you know, put it. Um, on the other hand, you have government um, who wants to stimulate the exchange of scientific ideas because if they can create a, a, a playing field to allow that exchange, the scientific community benefits. So, you know, an example I typically give is, let's say, Dave, you, you invented the first laser, okay? And um, if you disclose your laser invention at a conference or wh however, a paper, or however you do it, and I am a surgeon and I read your laser paper, I, you know, I may say, you know what, I bet you if I, if I fit some type of lens focusing system to that laser invention, I can now come up with a surgical application for your laser that you never thought of and that I never would have thought of if I didn't know your, right? So, so this type of exchange of ideas is really what the patent system is about. Now, what incentive is it for the inventor? Yeah, it's nice for the government, good for you, but why should I do it, right? So, so the give and take is really the government says to the inventor, if you, inventor, disclose to me, the government, something that is novel, it's got to be new, right? And also not obvious, meaning I can't figure it out for myself from what I already know, then your reward will be the patent, which gives you a certain term of protection. And during that term, you could prevent others from making, using, selling, or offering for sale the invention that's disclosed in the patent. It's a lot of words, I know, but but that's the idea. That's the give and take. So you as the inventor need to show the government in the form of your patent application um, that you have created something novel and not obvious. And often you'll get rejected because, um, you know, uh, Mr. Smith came up with this in 1970. Look at this old disclosure, this old patent. I'm showing you it's not novel, right? Hey, Ed, I got this rejection. Help me, help me argue against this. Maybe we can make changes to the patent application claims in order to, to get it through and so on. Okay, so grandma's recipe for uh, apple pie, let's say. It's a special recipe that grandma has uh, passed down from one generation to the next. And now I'm making grandma's apple pie and people tell me how great it is. And I decide I'm going to sell grandma's apple pie. Is that, can I patent that recipe or? So that's, that's not, that's not going to be something that is patentable. Okay. Right. Um, and the reason for that is, you know, the, the, the mixture of ingredients okay, would be sort of an obvious type of process, right? This recipe, this, this method of making a pie or a pie that is made by this particular, uh, by these steps, right? Um, you know, those are sort of obvious to try. You know, the crust is flakier. How come? Because you add more, I don't know, shortening into it. Mm -hmm. Everybody knows that if you add more shortening, you're going to create a fluffier crust. And if you add, you know, these types of, of let's say, obviousness um, rules of nature or whatever you want to call it, you know, it you you bake it less because the pie is underbaked and that's what adds more, I don't know, moisture to it, right? These kinds of things are not generating a real unexpected result. You know, it's not like two plus two equals five. Oh, wow, check that out. No one would have thought 
that by increasing the temperature this much and reducing the whatever that much, you would come up with something unexpected. So that that's why that recipe wouldn't wouldn't work. You're not creating something really new. Um, the Coca-Cola recipe, right? That's uh, we, we we're going back to their trade secret. Um, so this Coca-Cola recipe, um, number one, by not going down the patent road, it remains a secret forever, right? Not just for the life of the patent, which is 20 years from the filing date of the application. So it goes on forever. And um, the other the other consideration is it, it may be difficult for people to reverse engineer the exact formula, right? Um, and that thinking also goes into some of the big software companies who decide whether should we try to go for a patent on this particular coding or subroutine or whatever, or should we keep this as a trade secret? You know, some of these software companies, they decide yes for this and no for that. And how come? Because, you know, they're making a, a calculated decision in many instances of people probably won't figure this out. They won't be able to reverse engineer it. So why should I file my patent application, tell people what I'm doing? What if I don't get my patent? Now they know what I'm doing, right? So this type of calculation goes into that, that analysis. Okay, so now I want you to share with us the other the other types of intellectual property law, and I want you to give us just a you know a, a, a really quick overview on how those things are protected, and then we're going to talk about how those all types of IP law add value to a business, and we're going to do that in just one minute. Before we do, I need to remind folks that. Our show is brought to you by Sandrowski Corporate Advisors. For over 35 years, Sandrowski has helped people all over the United States with their advanced accounting needs. So with sophisticated accounting needs, we're talking about family office advisory, dispute advisory, business valuation, litigation support, forensic accounting, that sort of thing. Also risk management. So if you're, let's say you're an attorney and you're involved in some sort of a litigation matter and at issue is the value of a company. You have a partnership dispute and the two partners are breaking up. And the one partner alleges that the business is worth more than the other partner is uh, is admitting. Sandrowski can go in and they can review not only the business's financials, but they can look at comparable businesses in the industry and maybe even in the geographic area. And they can then testify to their valuation of the business. Now, why is it important to bring in someone like Sandrowski to do this? Well, there are three reasons why it's important to bring in a firm that has this type of experience. And one is they have to have experience in doing this for this specific purpose. The second is they have to be able to figure out exactly what the value of the business is in that specific industry. And Sandrowski has experience in over two dozen different industries valuing businesses. And the third is they have to have the ability to testify in court in a way that is easy for the court and potentially a jury to understand. And that's no small feat. Well, the experts at Sandrowski have been doing this for 35 years. They've been testifying in court. They've been doing business valuations. So they are the go-to firm for this. So if you're a lawyer and you have a business dispute and you need a valuation done, I encourage you, give Sandrowski a call. You can reach them at 866-717-1607, 866-717-1607. Sandrowski Corporate Advisors is a CPA firm with a different perspective. We're also brought to you by my revenue roadmap guide. You're a professional. You want to build out your book of business. So you're an engineer, you're a consultant. You want to add clients to your book of business. I've got a system and I'm going to give it to you for free. It's my way of saying thank you for joining us today. You can download my system by going to revenueroadmapguide.com, enter your contact info. You can download my business development plan and customize it for you and your professional service firm. This is the same business development system that I use with my clients. Download it for free right now. Go to revenueroadmapguide.com, enter your contact info, download it today. 
Okay, Edward, there's two other types of uh, intellectual property. Talk about what they are briefly and explain how intellectual property can add to the value of a business, please. Okay, so the, so the first one would be trademarks. Trademarks is branding. Um, um, so with branding, you are protecting your brand, right? Coca-Cola's trademark is a very strong brand. Um, and the branding will often add uh, significant value um, to your your product line, to your business, to your services, wh whatever it is. You know, when when I think it was um, Kraft sold some of their business years ago, it goes back to probably the late 90s or so. Um, I remember, you know, multiple billions of dollars kicked around for the sale of their brands. And... Um, the purchaser was not buying the factories or the infrastructure or anything because they were moving a lot of those brands overseas. They wanted Oreo. They wanted Ritz. They, that's what they wanted. You know, they could care less about, about the real stuff. Okay, so branding, branding will add um, value because people recognize that a brand has um, a, a level of quality attached to it you know, good, bad, or ugly, it is a level of quality attached to it. Um, um, so that, that's why branding is important um, to, you know, most businesses, right? Most businesses, even if they don't have patent issues, they would certainly still have some type of branding trademark issues um, to distinguish them from others who do the same thing that they may do. Um, copyright is another feel, another form of IP, intellectual property. Copyright is something that protects the expression of an idea as opposed to protecting the idea itself, which is more in the realm of patents. So expression of an idea is a song, a play, or a writing, could be even software code. Um, so for example, um, you know, West Side Story you know, the play West Side Story is the expression of some type of forbidden love. You know, the the one one person's on one side, one person's on the other side, their families are fighting, they, whatever, that, this kind of tragic ending. It's basically Romeo and Juliet, which goes all the way back and is in the public domain. Um, but West Side Story is a, a an expression of that idea. Um, so... So copyrights can be valuable if somebody is copying you, right? Because you can't have copyright infringement without copying. So somebody has to copy you, um, whereas patents, they don't have to copy you. If they never saw your invention and they come up with it on their own, they would still be infringing, you, you know, trespassing, infringing on your patent because you have protection for that concept irrespective of you know, an overt copying um, action. Okay. Now, once we have our, our intellectual property protected, maybe we have a patent, but we have n numerous trademarks. We have um, some of our individual unique writings are, are protected by copyright. How does all of that intellectual property add to the value of our business? Well, um, one way is it really gives you your your um, your marketplace, your market segment, where you can offset and distinguish yourself from others. Um, you know, people look at patents um, not just from, let's say, the VC world, where they think that a company is innovating and they you know have like a, a, a protectable niche over competitors. But they're also looking at branding, you know, your, your brand, and now maybe you have some franchises, fran you know, some franchise locations, and it adds value because people recognize, you know, I, I, I want a Starbucks, not a Dunkin' Donuts, or I want a, you know, what, whatever it is, right? They, they can show some type of um, brand uh, affinity, brand recognition, loyalty, whatever. Um, right, so that adds value to so it. So you could um, you could franchise or even license that brand to other people, and as long as they you know maintain the integrity of the brand, they use it in return for a fee. So you can collect a fee by allowing other people to use your brand. 
Absolutely. I mean, many, many, many um, uh, trademark platforms work that way. You may be in your particular space and you want to license the name out for a line of you know, house paints and you're in the fashion industry or you want to go more into the housewares and now you're going to have, I don't know, designer shower curtains or something, even though you're known in the, in the clothing industry, right? So, so as long as the quality control, which is always the key with trademarks, mm-hmm. um, is at some certain standard, you know, um, and there's, you know, quality control exercises that have to take place to make sure that's the case, that is a way to, you know, add value to your company. Okay. Now, Ed, tell me a little bit about people who come to you and they need a, an opinion. How does, why, is, why are opinions, and I'm talking about a legal opinion now, not, hey, Edward, do you like this color? I mean, a legal opinion. How, why are opinions so valuable in the IP space? Why is a legal opinion so important in the IP space? And how do people use legal opinions in the intellectual property space? Um, well, the opinions that I have um, um, traditionally focused on would be patent types of opinions. But, um, you know, for trademark opinions, they're more, you know, um, from a clearance perspective. You know, in my practice, from a clearance perspective, I want to launch this brand. Um, let's do a search. Let's see what's out there. Um, am I far enough away from what I found so that um, I'm I'm comfortable moving forward? Right. Um, from from a patent um, from a patent perspective, the opinion may be: I want to make this thing, and I know that this patent or these patents are out there. And um, tell me if this thing I want to make encroaches, you know, infringes on that patent or those patents. Um, and if it does, maybe you can suggest something that I can change in what I want to make so that I'm no longer infringing on those patents. Um, right? So that would be one side of the patent opinion um, equation. The other side of the patent opinion equation is, I can't believe this person got a patent on that thing. Everybody knows that that's been done before and so on, or we saw it overseas and so on and so forth. Um, And look at these articles I have that predate this patent filing, the patent application filing date or whatever. Can you look at this and let me know what you think so that I know if this patent is really is invalid? Because if it is invalid, then I can basically do exactly what they're doing because I know that it, it's never going to, the chances of it being held up in court is slim, right? So, so those are the kinds of opinions. Why they're important, they're typically important, not just obviously for peace of mind, okay? Um, but they're, they're important because there, there are willfulness or trebling damage awards that can be uh, um, uh, given by the courts if you basically go down a path blindly, right? I mean, you know, you could win or lose and that's what lawsuits are for. But if you lose, but, you know, I, I acted on my advice of counsel. This was a close question. They looked at this. They gave me this well-reasoned opinion that gave me guidelines of what I should do. I followed their advice. Okay, it's a close question, right? That's why we're here in court. Otherwise it would have settled, presumably. Um, so there may be damages involved, but you wouldn't get slapped with willfulness because of that, right? And that's typically why people would go look for those opinions. Yeah, it demonstrates that you've done your homework. It really, you're acting in good faith. You did everything you could to make sure to try to to try to investigate to see, um, you know. And your even your attorney says, "Hey, listen, I think you're okay here." So you did everything you could, and it demonstrates it to the court. And if you lose, you don't get you don't get stung as badly as if you just you know, will, willy nilly went off and, and infringed on, on somebody's intellectual property. So Ed, what do you, as a, as an IP attorney, as an intellectual property attorney who sees a lot and you, you work at a, you work at uh, Cozen O'Connor, which is a good size firm. So you guys get, 
you know, high profile uh, matters from time to time. What is it that you don't like about uh, about what you do? What is it that that bugs you about the practice of law? Um, you know, the the l- law school teaches you how to think like a lawyer, right? Spot spot issues, um, which, by the way, is an interesting change from from the engineering science curriculum. Because in the science curriculum, you know, here's the an- here's this major problem, and the answer is minus five. And if you came up with five, you know, that bridge falls down and people die, right? Mm-hmm. That's 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 what it is, right? In the legal field, well, maybe it's five, maybe it's not five, you know, um, right? You're you're sort of spotting spotting the issues, so you're you're trained to think like a lawyer, um, but but in in private practice. Um, you need to develop a a, um, a business person skill, and you know that business person skill sometimes is nice. You know, you get to interact with clients, and you feel like you're you're doing a good job for them, and they hopefully appreciate it, which they don't always say, but you like to think that they do. Um, but there's also the side of uh, um, uh, administrative things that go along. Right, billing, um, uh, um, client relation things. Um, you know, the, these types of administrative things are not really why. You know, they're, they're they're part of the gig, okay? But they're not why people go to law school and become attorneys. All right, so. I think you're I think you're probably not in the minority. I've heard before from other people that some of the administrative, the onerous administrative stuff that goes along with the practice of law is kind of annoying and uh, and bugs people. One of the things I thought you were going to say was that you couldn't stand patent trolls. Explain to people, because I particularly that that really bugs me. Explain to people, um, you know, in a uh, in in a really easy way what a patent troll is and uh we can spend a minute or two talking about why i can't stand them <laughs> um well well you know a patent troll is, is a loaded word um the the i would say the more politically correct word or term is a non-practicing entity i think that's that's what you know because you know just like lawyers right sometimes you represent this side of the issue sometimes you represent that side of the issue it's the same thing you know with clients sometimes you represent you know a client who you're you're defending your client against a patent troll mm-hmm. or you're representing your client who's a non-practicing entity trying to obtain you know royalties because other people are infringing their patent Right. So I will say this. Okay, Um, you could have independent inventors who come up with some very cool stuff and they're disclosing their ideas to the public and they may not be able to get a licensing partner and they don't have the wherewithal to manufacture the thing or or whatever. You know, there's all kind of they tried. They went bankrupt, whatever it is. they definitely came up with something that no one else thought of. And for for someone on the other side to basically say, yeah, whatever, I'm, I'm going to do it, you know, and they're coming after you for licensing fees saying you're practicing my invention, you know, you should pay something to, I mean, it's basically a, a trespass, you know. Well, th- this guy keeps walking across my front lawn every day and he should pay to use my front lawn for the shortcut, right? Right. I mean, that's kind of what what a patent is, in effect. You know, you have your property. Someone's so, so. I think the issue comes up where these non-practicing entities now are accumulating the different pieces of the patent puzzle by this person's patent that has some of the area covered and another person's patent has some of the area covered and whatever and they put together sort of a portfolio that now covers a wide bigger piece of property right and now they're basically going after typically industries you know whatever the industry is um we have these patents you're infringing we're offering you a license the license is much 
more reasonable than if you wanted to fight, right? Um, right, because there's always that that you know cost analysis. You know, what's it going to cost if I fight this and maybe I invalidate this patent or these patents? Because he has ten of them now, right? What's it going to cost? He's only asking for I don't know forty thousand dollars for whatever. It's a, it almost it could it's a nuisance value. Where what's your what's your pain threshold? So sometimes you're representing these patents, right? These patent owners. Sometimes you're defending against these patent owners, and it's it's um it's a difficult issue that that Congress has been grappling with for a little while already. You know, one person's non patent non practicing entity is another person's troll. Mm hmm. No, I get it. I get it. All right, Edward, I'm going to ask you to uh, give us three things, three things that we should take away from our time together today. You gave us kind of a masterclass on uh, intellectual property. So take a minute and think about the three things we should take away from our time together. Well, I remind the folks who are watching, the folks who are listening, that we're brought to you by Sandrowski Corporate Advisors. Since 1983, Sandrowski Corporate Advisors has provided expert client service to people all over the United States. They have expertise in tax planning, consulting, family office advisory, dispute advisory, business valuation, litigation support, forensic accounting, and risk management. If you have a need in any of these areas, I'd like you to call 866-717-1607, 866-717-1607. Sandrowski Corporate Advisors is a CPA firm with a different perspective. We're also brought to you by My Revenue Roadmap Guide. Get your business development plan regardless of what area of professional services you work in. Go to revenueroadmapguide.com, enter your contact info now. You can download the intellectual property that I own, the system that I use to help my clients build their book of business. revenueroadmapguide.com, enter your contact info. You can download it and customize it for your professional professional practice today. Okay, Ed, what are the three things we need to take away from our time together? Okay, so um, I would um, suggest that um, you, you, people who need intellectual property protection or have questions about it, look to an attorney or a firm that's well versed in all the areas of intellectual property that we, that I mentioned um, during this, during this um, podcast, because they intersect often. You know, you may have patents here, but maybe that's better for copyright. Maybe this is better for trademark protection. And to have a, an attorney and or a firm that can, that is well-versed in those areas, that will give you your your best shot at protecting what you need. Okay. Um, the, the, the second thing, which is really permeates through all of our industries is that we are in, the we're in the service business okay the service business you know if i hear a story of you know an attorney who doesn't return a client's call for a while or it takes too long to get their email response or something like that um you know that's an opportunity for me because you know they need to hear from you even if it's i got your message i'm busy with something I'll get back to you later today or something, you know, you need to make sure that you're getting good service because there are a lot of people who do what I do. Um, they're, they're all, you know, they're all so good. Um, and you, you know, you're using one versus the other. And sometimes it comes down to, you know, getting, uh, you know, responsiveness, right? Responsiveness and billing, billing on time sending me a copy of what you filed on time so i know you did it and i don't have to ask you hey was this done last night you know those types of those types of um courtesies i think go a long way um and the last thing is more of you know sort of an overreaching you know you want to work with someone i think that you like um uh, maybe it overlaps with the first point with my second point of service but you want to work with someone you like someone who you uh, um, um, you trust is uh, is a good advisor, but is also someone that you can uh, um, re relate to in some way. 
That's great. Ed, thank you so much. This has been a great time together for us to learn more about intellectual property. Those of you who are listening, those of you who are watching, you can reach Edward Weiss at Cozen O'Connor by calling 212-297-2660 or I'm gonna put his email address in the show notes. You can reach out to him via email, 212-297-2660. For all of your intellectual property needs, all of your intellectual property issues, you have a question about intellectual property, you need an opinion, Edward Weiss is the guy. You can reach him, 212-297-2660. Ed, thank you so much for joining us today. It was wonderful having you here. Thanks, Dave, my pleasure, thank you. All right, folks, that'll do it for another edition of the Inside BS Show. We're back here again tomorrow. Until then, I'm Dave Lorenzo, and here's hoping you make a great living and live a great life.